I'm ashamed I did. I'm, I'm so ashamed. Always <laughs> underwear. But, but I'm so ashamed. But, but it's it, it, it's not clean. <laughs> you don't have to look at your underwear. You have to look okay. at your ass. One, two, three. Okay, you're right. Wait, wait, wait. Let me unzip. Wait a while. Okay. Okay. Wait, Do we have to look over our shoulders? I'll come out in, uh, in the same way. One-stop shopping center. Wait, how, how long are we going to do this? Enough so that they can get a good deal, right? Shake the chair. Don't. 40 years ago. No, well, but now he, you know, he said, I want gays in the military, I want this, I want that, I want that, and they were all high ideals okay, during, the the during the campaign, right. yes, during yeah, the campaign. Yeah, but I mean, that to me is a low ideal, but And anyway. now it's like he's saying that the emperor has no clothes, but he's the fucking emperor. That's my problem. Yeah, but uh, the theory was that oh, he was that he was, that yeah, he was I that he was an idealist in his first governorship, which he, and then he lost. You know, he was not reelected. After that, he learned how to compromise, and his first compromise, I think, was with the biggest corporation in the uh, state, the Chicken Corporation. Yeah. Well, you and know, it's, it's been down. Well, I think you, you know. Do you vote? There was no well, chicken shit in the river. The chicken shit of Arkansas almost destroyed his campaign. Actually. You know, at first, the first things, we, the only things we knew about him was that uh, he dodged the draft, and Jennifer showed him her flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's and been downhill ever since. I don't like him for being uh, for being uh, uh, for capital punishment. Yeah, right. Um, no, so you know, but but. Yeah, but what's uh, left? Do you vote? Did you vote for him? Uh, sometimes I vote. I didn't vote for him. No, I voted I for mean, the socialist. I mean, I finally think of of. Um, of politics as like the missing link between um, um, the status quo and the force of evolution. And so, uh, uh, you know, in order to be a politician, you apparently have to take, there are separate, there are uh, uh, exceptions like uh, Bernie Sanders, the socialist uh, senator mm -hmm. from Vermont, or is he a congress congressman. congressman from, uh, you know, and there are a few others. Um, and and you even some see them get caught. I really respect Ron Dellums. And yeah. he was always questioning the military, and suddenly he's head of that committee, uh, but he uh, has to defend and try and hold on to the, the military bases in California because that's his constituency and that's their jobs. Yeah, so, well, it's sort of the, if you push a little further and you got the Eichmann argument, the thing is uh, people are deluded by the whole uh, constitutional system. They think that... Uh, well, wait, say what you mean by the Eichmann argument, because there's probably viewers who are young enough not to know that Adolf Eichmann... Well, they're, they're just following the institutions. They're pu caught in a vast as, machine. As and Adolf Eichmann... The, yeah, and they're caught, and they do the best, uh, the best they can. I'm sure he tried to arrange comfortable trains for the people that were being sent to their... <laughs> not even. And it, and it wasn't easy, right. So uh, it's sort of a big uh, hype, and, it, and it's a displaced, it's, it's all a fraud. So that's what you lose. I don't, I don't mind if you vote without illusions, you see. There are some that are wor less bad than others. Well, yeah, I didn't vote for Clinton and Gore so much as I voted against Bush and Quayle. I would be really gloomy if, the, if they were in. Well, I you know that saying that if uh, voting uh, could do anything real, it would be uh, prohibited. There are a lot of other ways to change things besides uh, voting. It's you know there are direct there's direct action. Uh, and if we're going to vote, what we need is like a new constitution. We need a new party. Here's the only country in the in the Western world, the only industrialized nation that doesn't even have a labor party. Um, you know we're incredibly backward here, and we have you know Gore Vidal said there. Are, that the, we have two wings of the same party, the uh, Democrats and the Republicans, and the, it's the capitalist party that we have. We don't the have a choice. Labor parties in a lot of countries are much like the Democrats here. Huh. Yeah, but in some countries they're not, and at, le uh, at least, for instance, if there was some movement. But here it's just been a continuous deception since the... Uh, in England, Australia, when, when, the when the country was started, the uh, power was pushed as far away uh, as possible from the people. You know, uh, there was a reason why the, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention uh, ordered all notes to be burned. They didn't want... Uh, the first cover-up. Yeah, they didn't want uh, what was discussed there to become known. They kept the window shut in the middle of the summertime, too, so no one could sit under the window and eavesdrop. Wow. And Benjamin Franklin, I hope you can hear this. 
Benjamin <laughs> Franklin was assigned a muzzle because they used to go through cases of wine at the end of the day in the local <laughs> tavern. That's a good part. Wine and had a few, he'd start oh, I saw, talking saw. about stuff he shouldn't. So there was a guy who was Martha assigned Mitchell kind of to him to, w to say, Ben, shut up. Don't wow. talk about that. Wow. Did you know George this Washington? This George Washington grew hemp. Yeah, but he didn't and smoke it. it. Um, because people didn't smoke he it. He made it in brownies. No, and, no, it was. And, and he got no. the munchies, and he ate all of Martha's Ro rope candy. Rope and paper were made out of it. Is that what he lost all his teeth? It was and, a cash oh, crop. Yeah, it was right. a cash crop. But um, did you know that only 10% of the population could vote, according to the first Constitution? Women couldn't vote. Black people couldn't vote, Indians couldn't vote, and you had own property to vote. Huh. So that was a real democracy with 10% of the population. Well, there's a story in my book. Uh, uh, I, I was a, a child prodigy violin player and was the youngest ever to uh, play in Carnegie Hall at the age of six. And then I gave it up because I had a technique for playing the violin, but I had a passion for making people laugh. Mm -hmm. and, um, so. Um, uh, in 1978, I think it was, I was invited to dinner at uh, the home of uh, Tom Laughlin, who played Billy Jack in that series of movies. And he's a real enthusiast for Thomas Jefferson, and he has Thomas Jefferson uh, furniture and Thomas Jefferson chinaware and China, uh, Thomas Jefferson recipes that they made. We had peanut soup, and he had Thomas Jefferson's violin. And he handed me, this was Billy Jack handing me Thomas Jefferson's violin, <laughs> of Damn. a very dreamlike <laughs> incident. <laughs> yeah, and then he said, and he asked me to play something on it, and I hadn't played the violin in like 40 years, uh, and so I, uh, so I, I took it, and I felt very strange. And I said, I'd like to dedicate this to Thomas Jefferson's slaves, and then I played Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but um, um, you know. D d and then I told this to Dan, Danny Sheehan of the Christic Institute, you know, because he's a real Thomas Jefferson enthusiast. He said, well, you have to understand that he was a, a, a victim of the social customs at his time, meaning Jefferson. But um, I, maybe I'm projecting, but I can't imagine myself having a slave. Yeah, well, you have to be unless hero. unless you're, you're a victim. Well, I mean, he was unless you like to be well The heroes have to, you know have to be better than their time. That's why we respect them. Oh, okay, that's good. The yeah. heroes, I want to remember that the heroes have, have to, to be, be better than their times. <laughs> All right, I make I make uh, quote that and give well, you. Well, in the light of also that the best part of the Constitution yeah. are the are the amendments, the first ten. That's a strange instrument then that yeah. we use to govern ourselves. With the best part of the things that had to be pasted on later. Do you so, think it's the Constitution that's wrong, or just that um, everything's been perverted over time? Both. I mean, the Constitution was wrong, and uh, Why? it's been a good instrument for the ruling class. It served them well for 200 years. They respect it, and they point to it, and they change it slightly to advance their own interests. Mm -hmm. you, can have a, you can have amendments that will, br that will uh, bring it back from what I consider a true democracy. I mean, it's possible. Paul, if, you, if uh, you were to be a part of a third party movement in this country, what would it, what would it look like for you to join it? Um, I guess it would be a combination of the Greens and the Libertarians and the Anarchists. Uh, <laughs> but what, I mean, what parts? Well, you know, the, uh, the parts of the of the uh, Libertarians are uh, where there's uh, pro-choice, whether it comes to drugs or abortions, uh, the Greens because of uh, the ecological concern, um, the um, anarchists because you don't have to go to their meetings. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot the uh, workers, the workers, the and, workers? The farm, yeah, and, the, and the small farmers. Oh. There's still some of them around. They're, oh, yeah, and part, being of the, and part of the labor. You know, the best of each. It would be a, eclectic and it would just be an ideal, uh, it would be uh, you know, a, a humane party. It would be um, where uh, the the needs of the people. Uh, it would be a power that exercised power with compassion. I mean, that's the trouble uh, today, in a nutshell. That uh, the use of power without compassion. So, I mean, that would be the the bottom line. And how does that vision that you just articulated differ from what? You, the vision that you and your compadres had in 1968 when you went to Chicago. Well, that was that was an ideal vision uh, then too. Is um, it different, similar? 
How oh, so? oh, oh, well, now we would use computers. <laughs> 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 I mean, the technology changes. It's different. Then there was not an awareness. You know, all of the male leaders of the Yippies and the mobilization and all the other groups then got all this publicity, and a lot of the women did behind the scenes work and didn't get credit for it and were really necessary. And it would be different today, certainly. There would be uh, a lot of people uh, in that time uh, um, had no awareness that they were that they were uh, chauvinistic in their behavior mm -hmm. so that would certainly change why is it anita bryant like a polish lesbian because she likes to fuck men oh. <laughs> the uh the main uh failure of the 60s i think uh, was that it was a youth movement and a movement that was based uh although Part of it was a movement of the minorities in this country for justice. It was based on uh, a single issue uh, against the war. So what happened was that movement, primarily of youth, uh, didn't link up with the rest of life, with the people who were working, with their parents, and with the people who weren't middle class. It was middle class youth. Well, so although it seemed very strong and powerful at the time, it really collapsed when the uh, uh, Vietnam War ended, although it continued Except with many strands, right. But uh, there was no linkage with the vast majority of ordinary people who worked for a living. And, but I think that's uh, in England, you have a huge labor party, which in spite of its, all of its uh, faults, exerts a huge pressure. For instance, England has a national health plan. England has a a kind of uh, welfare system that no one uh, talks about cutting down too much when they get into trouble. It has uh, uh, better support for all the... Well, they privatized all their health care, all the hospitals and everything about... Well, the there's a resistance to it. Or, no, well, Canada do. has it, Canada has yeah, it too, and there's a strong third party in Canada. That's one you know something that interesting? Has. Norman Thomas ran for president six uh, succeeding, uh, uh, what do you call it? Elections. Elections, that's it. Uh, and um, virtually every one of, of his platform uh, uh, planks ha was adopted eventually by Republican and Democratic administrations, just not with, with those names uh, attached to it, with that label. Um, but, um, you know, are you, are, well, you know, you're, you're, um, You've been around a while. You know the games. Do you, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Well, I'm, uh, it's always good, better to be optimistic. And we have examples. Uh, uh, the 60s were completely uh, unpredictable, unpredicted. The 50s were one of the most dismal political uh, mm -hmm. reactionary periods. And uh, the nearest thing I can think to the 60s were the 1840s with the transcendentalists in New England and the young people. Well, and, and but as I travel, I see a kind of... But the 1830s were terrible, you know, so... I see a, 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 a similar kind of counterculture developing in the 90s that was in the 60s. I mean, the 60s, it, it exploded out of the, the blandness and repression of the Eisenhower-Nixon years, and now it's kind of evolving and exploding out of the blandness and repression of uh, the Reagan-Bush years. Reagan-Bush quail. Let's make it a little triple play there. What would you guys like to see in place in terms of what... Um, Okay, it's great to, you know, for have, for people to have equal rights and for the ecology stuff, the environmental stuff to take, get taken care of and all that, but what do you see coming in place to make sure that the country runs every day, that we can, you know, that the lights work, that we can buy and, and food, all that combine food. that with what you see, you know, these signs that make you, you know, little incidents of the people you've met that uh, make you want to just, because uh, I don't travel as much as you. Well, there's, uh, um, the, the people who, who kind of had their awakening in, in uh, the 60s are now, in, you know, in their late 30s, 40s, early 50s, uh, and uh, they're in all different walks of life, and they brought those value systems with them, and, uh, I, and you know, they all have different causes, maybe, but with the people in the community. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, different clusters. Uh, and um, just the way when Abby Hoffman went underground, he worked with the people in the community. He didn't work with uh, yippies and, um, as an organizer. And so these people have taken all their organizing skills and the value system, and I've seen them in causes, whether it's abortion rights or animal rights or uh, the rainforest or, um, uh, or glaucoma. <laughs> 
Uh, well, yeah, I mean, in terms of that medical marijuana, th there's a big uh, movement uh, growing uh, to decriminalize marijuana. Okay, so how do we get <laughs> all of these movements together so yeah, that they all exercise some kind of support? Apart, and, and the kids that are late teens, 20-something now, how do they benefit from the wisdom that you guys have, having gone through the 60s and early 70s? All you kids out there, call this number. At the, uh, you'll see the number appearing at the bottom of the screen, and you'll be able to get guidance of this type. The type you need from a legend mm. sitting here with us, Paul Krasner. Oh. Uh, I'll, uh, no, but no, I'm, totally, I know. I'm, I'm, serious, I'm totally right? serious. Yeah. How, how can that wisdom and the lessons learned, positive and negative, be passed on to the kids that are coming now, up that, today? That's an important question. Um, Abby Hoffman, uh, you know, his loss was on two levels. One as a friend and two as one who had a lot more to contribute. Uh, he wanted to start a school for organizers. I mean, he really wanted to have that as, as an ongoing process. Um, now, now um, maybe, maybe Jerry Rubin can bankroll it now. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, <laughs> right. No That's a line on the book. If Abby Hoffman threw uh, money in the stock exchange today, this time Jerry Rubin would invest it. Um, but, you know, you start with nine-year-old kids. Nine-year-old kids uh, are aware of stuff that we were never aware of until our early 20s. I mean, uh, it's a whole different awareness now. And, um, you know, I mean, all those guys who had blueprints like Marx, Marx didn't know about the psychedelic revolution. Uh, Marx didn't know about the feminist revolution. Um, what other revolutions were there? Uh, the Russian Revolution. <laughs> he didn't know about that, that it would yeah. happen in a, a, a country where it would have incredible difficulty in the succeeding. Uh, right, maybe the cybernetic revolution. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had no idea about these things. Uh, but I, I see, um, uh, not to use my book as, as the answer to your question, but I do see um, parents, these parents buying it for their, for their uh, late teenagers or early 20s or, or even uh, preteens to show what it was like. And I find those kids buying it for their parents saying, you know, this is, you know. So there is an intergenerational thing going on now, which wasn't going on in the 60s. They had the myth of the generation gap. And um, um, I, I think that um, I know that there are uh, publishers waiting to see if my book does well, uh, to see if it's like going to be part of the crest of a wave of uh, a, a, a kind of alternative history of our times. And um, uh, because people don't know, people don't, you know, they have very short attention spans and they get taught propaganda in the schools. And this is almost... Uh, um, so I, I think as they learn about their roots and as they see that it was fun, that responsibility is fun, and um, uh, I think they'll organize in groups. You're right, it's still, you know, uh, the Chicanos at UCLA were mostly the ones who were sitting in because they wanted a Chicano studies department. So there seems like this, you know, separation here and here and here and here. People are interested, you know, uh, act up is mostly involved with gay rights. Uh, but um, I think, and this was what Jesse Jackson wanted with his Rainbow Coalition, that there can be a coming together of all these mm -hmm. seemingly disparate groups. I mean, that's one of the things I'm optimistic about. But what's, what's the unifying uh, theme or issue or catalyst that's going to make that happen? Uh, empowerment. They realized that uh, what Benjamin Franklin, uh, despite the fact that he had to be muzzled, uh, uh, that Benjamin Franklin was right when he said, if we don't stand together, we'll fall together. Oh, no. I think it has uh, to be united. We we surely you, hang together or we will hang separately. Right. I think, uh, <laughs> well, who, then who said it united, united we... Well hung. I think it was uh, truly. <laughs> oh, right. I think uh, we have to talk about the basic economic system. It doesn't have to be a Marxist change. I wanted to talk but we more about sex and Peru. We can't. This subjects. is all about sex because sex is uh, pro sex is, has been considered property. We're talking property. Yes. Well, How much rent do you pay? This place is thirteen hundred and fifty dollars mm -hmm. a month. I hate to. I'm not going to ask you how you get the money, uh, but you know everyone. Is, well, I'll ask. Everyone. Everyone. Well, being is independently wealthy helps. Everyone okay. has to. Everyone has That's to. That's our advice. Be independently for, wealthy. Work for the landlord. Everyone has to spend their lives uh, in a futile yeah. or stupid job. Most people don't like what they're doing. 
because there's a system here called capitalism, which is based on private property and the rights of ownership, which are enforced at the point of a gun by, by your police departments, and are uh, enforced internationally right. by uh, huge armies. And then so, taboos are created to create artificial scarcity of the basic things of life that we all come supplied with, so that we have to buy it. Well, if somebody comes to your apartment and wants to take out your TV set, yeah. are you going to say no? That uh, uh, say help no. yourself. Help yourself. There's no. Well, some people property. used to steal my typewriter on the east side. I didn't like it, but I didn't call for the cops. I was going to send someone away for a year for stealing a, a, a stupid typewriter. Um, all right. I mean, that, and that, if they that's took a, my TV, it might be a good thing. <laughs> right. No, that's <laughs> yes, that's why we're room. that's why we're doing this thing right now. It's like a well, a we're not TV. Very we're very public access. This is not outside. television. What you're seeing now, it's not. It's well, different. it's certainly it's not else. like most television. Is no, it's it? not. We're you, uncensored. You don't hear, you won't hear this on NBC. Kiss, fuck, cocksucker, all the yeah, and communism, democratic communism, and anarchism. Say the secret word. And um, the secret fuck comes down. And uh, <laughs> I want to know uh, your opinion as you, as an expert. Well, how many people? Do you th how many people do you think see this? Do you have any idea? You, it's not measured by the Nielsen ratings. No. Well, no, it is. It's just not. The information's not revealed. You oh. think there's something they don't know about what's on? Oh. oh. There are four hundred thousand uh, public Almost a half a million uh, you know, subscribing households. I wanted to start a program, a, a sitcom called The Nielsen Family, <laughs> and I, I was going to get a hundred percent of the share. <laughs> but, oh well. Yeah. Someday, another thing I didn't do. Well, you're you're you, but on this on the subject of of censorship, and it's isn't it great that we don't have to be censored on this thing? Fuck yes. Fuck yeah. <laughs> uh, you're an expert on on pornography, and you you, you worked for Hustler magazine and only for only for six months. Well, but I've because but I've censored, right? right? But I've jerked off for sixteen years. So. <laughs> right. So I was just wondering if if you could, you know, we're we're trying to decide is there a point at which something is pornographic, it's obscene. I mean, it, you, I just would like to know your opinion. What is there a boundary? Well, it's subjective. You know, there are people who think that nudist magazines are obscene, right. but to nudists, they're just a family album. Right. right. You know, like home movies. Right. So it's, it's totally subjective. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that uh, violence is obscene. Uh-huh. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I... I I, I mean, the irony, I, th I think that cigarette advertisements are obscene. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's all a, a point of view. But in terms of, of um, but pornography is thought of as something that arouses the prurient interest. But, uh, you know, people thought my Disneyland memorial orgy was obscene, but... Um, but it was a work of art. Well, that's the point, yeah. And also, how could it be, you know, who would say in court, you know, at, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, are you aroused by this portrait of goofy fucking Minnie on the cash register? You know, I mean, uh, laughter is kind of a, an antidote to, yeah. to um, hard-ons. <laughs> <laughs> was it, wasn't it, who said that? Was that uh, Thomas Paine? No, Thomas in pain. Oh, you're getting the credit for everything. Yeah, right, oh. Tooley's little red book. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about, um, I mean, they if if anyone actually goes kids. out and buys this book and reads it, they'll, they'll be... I'm just going to bring this in so you can see the cover. You, it's, it's got a nice color scheme. It's pink and yellow. And the camera doesn't do justice to the color purple that no, it I'll, I'll, is. Later, I'll insert a better looking it's picture beautiful. of the book so it looks nice. Did you know the um, Einstein picture? The most the fantastic... I saw that, yeah, yeah. I kind of, now I'm sort of identifying with that. Story, there's a story about that. Oh, what's that? Oh, this uh, is the story of, of the picture of Einstein. The famous, let's all put our tongues out. And laugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when Einstein, what now, Guru? <laughs> when Einstein came to the States, he was like very big, you know, very big. I think he was talking at the New School, somewhere in the village at someone's... Uh, uh, Department, and the photographers were all over him, you know. So he'd gave him, given them enough uh, photographs and he wanted to go home. And he was in the car and this photographer was a very annoying photographer, a paparazzo. <laughs> and he pushed the camera right is in that, his is face. Is that the singular? Paparazzo? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. You don't know Italian, so I, don't know. Know. I could claim it. But I asked so, for mushrooms and cheese and you gave me a paparazzo. <laughs> so, so Einstein stuck his tongue out of him and that became like the most probably the second most famous picture of Einstein. It's just that every time someone puts a part. camera in your face, what's the first thing most people do? They put their tongue out. And, and laugh. Try to well, he wasn't laughing. Or kiss the lens or something. People kiss, kiss the camera. 
Um, could you maybe tell us a couple of little tidbits of pranks Ken Casey pulled on you? Just a couple of little nuggets from the oh, okay. trove. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> there was a time I was I was writing a piece on Richard Nixon, uh, and um, Richard Nixon would you know he was like the personification of the Freudian slip. I noticed in my research. So, for example, when uh, John Kennedy was killed, and then uh, a couple of days later, Lee Harvey Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby. A reporter asked Nixon uh, what he thought of that, and Nixon said, two rights don't make a wrong. <laughs> I mean, uh, but it was too late, you know, it was out there. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so I had this portrait of Nixon on the wall, a poster, and uh, just, just to inspire me while I was writing this piece, <laughs> and one time I came home, and there was something odd about the room. I couldn't figure out what it was, and I suddenly noticed that this portrait of Nixon, which had originally been looking towards the right, was now looking towards the left, <laughs> even though the whole face was looking towards the right. And, you know, like those ashtrays that follow you around. And so um, I looked more closely, and I could see that the original eyeballs had been whited out, and new eyeballs had been drawn in the other corners, and Ken Kesey had been around. You know, that was... That was his little private prank, because I was getting, I'd look to see if my daughter's photo, if her eyes were altered, but it was just Nixon. Yeah. Well, that's the right thing to do. He was tired of looking in that direction. Oh, yeah, no, I, I took it as an omen. <laughs> and it went from the left to the right, or the right the, to the... The right to the left. I took it as oh, an omen oh, that, that his good. political leanings okay, might change. Yeah. Maybe, that, maybe that's an omen. Maybe it's like a voodoo poster, maybe it... Mm, no, it didn't really work. Oh, you mean, oh, it forced his eyes to suddenly shift? Or that his, his ideology would shift. Oh, yeah, if it were only that easy. Mm. He's still up for the same stuff. Yeah, he's like a horror movie, you know. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's spending zillions yeah. of dollars um, making sure that the documents never get released. Millions of dollars a year on lawyers' fees. And oh, yeah, there's a, uh, uh, yeah. I forget the guy's name who did this biography of Nixon, but he describes how uh, when he was in the office with John Dean, he said, John, I want you to give me a complete report on this, but make it incomplete. <laughs> you know, and he's a walking paradox. Well, we're, we're still paying his pension and oh, yeah. I think his yeah. medical expenses. Are you, still, are you still paying your taxes? No comment. Oh, here's... Oh. <laughs> Here's that we again. You this were complaining. This is a this this we. here. I give that him per permission. He can say whatever he wants on this show. Because so we're not censored. We only have one C word. One, one C word, and that's commercialism. And uh, everything else is, is, is go. But you were censored one time for calling Lenny Bruce a Nazi. Oh, oh, yeah, that was on the old Les Crane show. I don't know if anybody remembers him, but he was sort of like the Ken doll in the Barbie set. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> and I was talking about how I didn't think I was Jewish because uh, uh, Judaism is a religion, and I didn't believe in the tenets of that religion. And uh, um, to say that, that I was Jewish anyway would make it seem like a race. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, how did I get Lenny into that? I forget. Um, oh, I know, I know. Uh, Lenny Bruce sent... Um, Lenny Bruce somehow agreed with that or something, but I, but anyway, I, I said, therefore, Lenny Bruce is a Nazi. Oh, it was and one of those logic things. Yeah, yeah, a syllogism. A syllogism. And so, um, uh, so Les Crane pressed the button, we were on seven seconds delay, mm -hmm. and, and I said, what'd you do that for? He said, Paul, that's actionable. And I said, can you imagine Lenny Bruce suing me because I called him a Nazi? <laughs> uh, so, but, you know, that's, that's the humor, that's the point of the humor. Yeah, the, you know, that they operate out of fear rather than, than <laughs> trusting the audience. Fear is the element. I thought the element of humor is when you get it. No. At the point when you get it, then it's funny. You get well, it. but humor is the antidote to fear, and, right. and obviously uh, he still wanted to keep the disease. <laughs> it does. Laughing actually releases chemicals, sp and, special and, chemicals. Endorphins. That, that hearty laughter can get you very, very high. That's true. We should try just laughing just the, for the about 30 seconds. Did you know the government is going around to schoolyards now with their campaign? You know, if somebody Laugh comes up to you, say, anybody comes up to you in the schoolyard and says, you want to hear a joke? Just say no.